fractal shape. All right, let's talk some more about compact sets. Compact sets. I thought maybe we would start off by way of a review, a um, start off with an old comprehensive exam question that I think actually I would, I would describe this as an easy question about compact sets. Uh, part A, they give you questions like this on the comp sometimes. Define what it means for a subset to be compact. Anybody happen to remember the definition? This is just like, do you remember the definition or not? K is compact. If not, you can turn the page and look at your notes from last time. Everybody saw the uh, Sierpinski. K is compact means. Anybody say it? I see people looking at it. No? Yes. You can make a sequence and then that sequence converges to the point that's in the set. Yes. So it means any sequence in the set has a convergent subsequence, and that subsequence converges to a point in the set. So I will say that this way, something like if xn is a sequence in k, then xn has a convergent subsequence. is what compact means, and the limit is in K. All right, this is what it means to be compact. Any sequence has a converging subsequence, and what it converges to is in K, all right? Last time we had a theorem that said that um, a compact set, a set is compact if and only if it is closed and bounded. So that's another way to think of compactness, but this is the definition of compactness in terms of sequences. All right, that was part A. Just, if you remembered it, full credit. If you didn't remember it, skip the whole question because it's all about compact sets and if you don't remember what that means then. Uh, part B, give an example of a bounded set that is not connected. Not a compact, sorry. <laughs> Compact is what we're talking about. A bounded set that is not compact, all right? So not compact means there's a sequence either which doesn't converge at all, um, I mean, which has no convergent subsequence, or maybe it does converge, but the limit is not in your set anymore. So can you think of a bounded set which is not compact? One over n? Yeah, I agree with that. He said one over n. It's always a good idea to think about this. Why is it not compact? It's not closed, that's true. Although, can you say in, term, in these terms here? <coughs> right, because there's a sequence in here, like the sequence, one over n. It converges to zero, but zero is not part of this set. So if I call this k, then the sequence one over n is in k, and one over n converges to zero, but zero is not in k. Great. This is a bounded set that is not compact. Yeah? Would negative one to the n be one? Negative one to the n. I think negative one to the n as a set is compact, because it's just this, as a set, negative one and one, Oh, any right. any sequence of those yeah right it, they have it has converged subsequence by just choosing all the positives or whatever all right um, I would have said uh, another natural answer to this would be the interval zero to one this also you can find a sequence in here which converges to zero I mean the same sequence really but uh, zero is not part of the set 
or a convergence uh, sequence that converges to one, but one is not part of the set. All right, great. That was part B. Part C, prove from the definition of compactness that the set containing zero is compact. All right, this one's a little weird, but I would say not, not hard once you, once you get down to it. But um, prove from the definition that the set containing zero is compact. So uh, what we have to prove is, given any sequence in that set, it has a convergent subsequence, and the limit of that subsequence is also in the set. All right, so I would say, here's my little proof. Um, you have to begin by saying let xk, or xn is what I call the sequence usually, be in my set, right? This is a sequence. Each of the terms is in that set. What can you say about this sequence? Yeah? It has to converge to zero. Yeah, in fact, this sequence, it just is zero over and over again, right? That's all it could be. So um, I would say then, um, you know, xn as a sequence, it just is this, this is the sequence, right? Okay, so is it true that it has a convergent subsequence? Yes, like any subsequence of that is convergent. So this has itself is a convergent subsequence, right? So this has a, a convergent subsequence. This is what we have to prove. I would just say temp uh, parenthetically, like itself is a convergent subsequence. The whole thing, count, that counts as a subsequence. And what does it converge to? It converges to zero. And zero is in the set containing zero, all right? Which is what we had to prove. So uh, hopefully you agree. I said this one looks kind of complicated, but it's actually not really. All right, any thoughts about that? Great, that was part C. Part D, prove that N is not compact. N, the natural numbers, is not compact. So not compact means either it has a sequence which with no convergent subsequence or it has a convergent subsequence, but what it converges to is not in the set. This is n. What do you think? Can you think of a sequence in n with no convergent subsequence? Yes? What would you choose? Yeah, how about the sequence xn equals n, right? The sequence one, two, three, four. That this has no convergent subsequence because it just in, it's increasing and unbounded, right? <coughs> this has no convergent. Well, really, what I should say specifically, what's important is this is a sequence in N, but it has no convergent subsequence. So N is not compact. All right, that's it. Here ends the comp question, little little warm up. I, th I thought all those questions were kind of easy, um, provided that you remember. You know, m I would say most of the comp questions look easy, like if you're talking about them on the day that you learned about compactness so that you still remember it. The hard part of the comp is just being able to remember everything um, so that uh, oftentimes you will see an easy question, but you won't realize that it's easy because you forgot something about what, what something means. Uh, that's really the hard part about the comprehensive. All right, great. Um, let's talk about something regarding compact sets, and then uh, we'll move on to something that seems a little out of nowhere, although it's very much related. Um, 
I mentioned last time that many of the theorems that we know and love about closed intervals are actually, more properly, uh, theorems about compact sets. And I wanted to do an example of that today. I mean, this is really the only uh, one of that nature that I really want to go through in detail. And that is, I want to talk about the nested interval property for compact sets. It turns out the nested interval property is not only a property of intervals. It actually is true for any nested compact sets. So if I have nested compact sets, then the statement is that their intersection is, um, is not empty. That's what the nested interval property says. So I'm going to write that as a theorem, and then we'll talk about it. Um, the, uh, the idea behind this, you know, doing the proof of the theorem is not so difficult. I mean, since we know the nested interval property already, um, I'm going to say let Kn be a sequence of compact sets. I'll say nested compact sets. All right, each one is compact, and they are nested. What nested means is... <laughs> You know, Kn plus 1 is a subset of Kn, right? Each, the next one is always smaller than the previous one. This is a sequence of nested compact sets. Then the intersection of them all, n equals 1 to infinity, is not the empty set. That's what the theorem says. Nested compact sets, their intersection, all of them, is not the empty set. All right? And, you know, when I talk about the nested interval property, uh, property, I always have a certain picture in mind, and I have a similar picture in mind for the nested compact sets. It's just they don't have to be intervals. Now, what a compact, what does a compact set look like? We said last time every compact set is closed and bounded, which means it could look like a closed interval, but it could also look like maybe a union of closed intervals, or it could look even weirder, like the Cantor set is also a compact set. So it could look actually very weird, but at least the picture that I have in my mind is something like um, maybe K is like a bunch of closed intervals, maybe some extra individual points, right? That's allowed in a in a compact set, maybe another closed interval, something like that. Yes? So, when you do this, like, when you have your big set, if you're then going to, like, start nesting. Yep. If the big set is compact, does that immediately mean that all of the nested ones are also compact? No, not necessarily. Although we are, we are requiring them, in the theorem, they are required to all be compact. But it's not good enough to just say, if I start with this big, the big set is compact, and then I make subsets, you can't just make any subset you want and expect it to also be compact. I think is that, if that's what you mean. Like, for instance, my next smaller set, I might take only this smaller interval. Maybe only those two points. I just leave out that point. Maybe make that interval a little bit smaller. Make this one a little bit smaller. This, is, this would be K2, my second compact set. All right? But you can, they, they have to be compact at all times. Like, you cannot, for instance, make the next one be this part but it's an open interval now like that is a subset but it's not compact and so that's not allowed mm -mm. all right etc right maybe this one goes all the way down to a single point which is still compact it just gets smaller every time but still compact every time all right and what it says is this intersection sorry I need to say nested non-empty uh, the empty set counts as compact but of course if you if you actually let any one of those sets be empty then the whole intersection will be empty which is which is not I'm not trying to feel that All right this is nested compact sets all right um, how are we going to show that there is a point that remains at the very end I guess I guess I'm going to write a proof here How can we demonstrate there is a point that remains at the very end? I was talking to my good friend Janet Struley earlier today. She said, you guys were all talking about this class and her class. 
and how I think she said she said a you said that um, I am less casual than she is, and more more uh, structured or formal or something. So that was that was her impression. You're all like, no, I didn't say that. No, no, that's not an insult. That was a joke. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was interested in that. I don't mind that. That's fine. Um, I don't know why it occurred to me to think about that at this moment. Because uh, we're doing a proof. She does proofs too, right? She must do proofs. Yeah. Um, uh, All right, what we're gonna do is um, we have to demonstrate that the set at the end, like the intersection of everything is not the empty set. So I'm going to imagine, because none of the individual sets are empty, so since, this, I would say this proof is not obvious how to start it off. Um, some proofs you kind of do a natural thing and maybe there's some details but it ends up working out. This is an example of a proof where you have to have kind of a cute idea which then works out. But the idea is not, that obvious. But anyway, I'm going to say since kn is not empty for each n, that means like there is at least a point in, a, in all of these sets. I'm not saying the same point in every set. That's actually what we want to prove is that there is one point in all of the sets. That's because the, pro the point of the theorem is that the intersection is not empty. So there is actually something in all of them. But uh, anyway, since kn is not the empty set for each n, there exists a sequence I can make a sequence xn with xn in kn for each n. All this means is I'm just making a sequence where I choose a point at each level. So maybe I'm going to write some green dots here. Maybe at the next level it's over here, next one it's over here, next time it's over there, right? I'm just making a sequence where I just choose one point at each stage. That's it, right? Uh, I'm gonna try to explain why that sequence converges. Can we say why that sequence, actually this sequence by itself may not converge, but it at least has a convergence subsequence. Um, First of all, would you agree with me that all of these points are in K1, aren't they? Because of the nesting, right? The, these, these sets get smaller every time, so any point which is in K2 is, is automatically in K1. So all of these, all of Xn are in K1 for every N. And K1 is compact. Right? Because that's one of our assumptions. So what does that mean? It means that Xn has a convergent subsequence. And what it converges to is in K1, right? Because that's what compact means. So K1 is compact. So Xn has a convergent subsequence. And the limit of that subsequence is in K1, all right? It's because K1 is compact and all the terms of the sequence are in K1, all right? Okay, I would like to consider what about this limit? Can I call the limit here? Let's call it X. We, uh, we ended up showing that X is in K1. Um, I think actually almost everything I said here, instead of K1, you could have said K2. Um, all of these points are in K1. Now, the actually, would you agree if I said that they're also all in K2, except maybe the first one is not. 
but all the rest of them are, are also in K2 because of the nesting, right? Except maybe the first one is not. So can I say um, all of Xn except maybe X1 are also in K2, right? Take out another one? Um, because, well, the second one is in K2, that's part of its definition. And then the third one is in K3, but K3 is nested inside of K2. And the fourth one is, is also nested inside of K2. Like all the, all the ones below here are, are nested inside of K2. It's only the first one maybe is not in there, right? And so, what that means is when I look at this sequence, it converges to X, which is in K1. Actually, since all of these terms, except the first one, are in K2, actually what it converges to also is in K2. It's not just in K1, because all the terms of this sequence, except the, the first one doesn't even matter in terms of where it converges to eventually. All the other ones are in K2. So all of the Xn, except maybe X1, are also in K2. So actually, this, sub, this sequence here, Xn converging to X, These are in K2, I will just say, eventually, like past the first one. But when it comes to things converging, the first one doesn't even matter at all, right? So this sequence, they are all actually in K2 eventually. And since K2 is compact, that means that X is in, uh, not only is it in K1, which we said before, it's also got to be in K2 because K2 is compact. And this is a sequence all of whose terms, except maybe the first one, are in K2. So these are in K2, so X is in K2 since K2 is compact. All right. This sequence is eventually all the terms are in K2. Would you, um, anybody see where I'm going with this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This. So I said this here. Yeah. Which the interpretation of this is x n is in k n for each n. That means x one is in k one, x two is in k two. It doesn't necessarily mean that. Every xn is in every kn. I think, yeah, that's a little. That's a good, a good point to uh, work, wonder about. Yeah. So, are you basically going to try to like say the like generalize this for all the things? Yeah. Like, right. You could say it's over and over. Yes. So x xn is in k1, which means the limit is also in uh, k1, right? But xn, all of them except the first one, are in k2, which means the limit is is actually in k2. You can keep on saying this. All of them except the first two are in K3, which means the limit is also in K3. So I will say similarly, X, that limit is also has to be in K3 because all the terms of the sequence except the first two of them are in K3. And so what it converges to is also in K3. And X is in K4, right? Etc. So actually X is in KN for all N. No matter what the N is, the X is going to be in there. And what does that matter? Actually that is what we wanted to prove. Remember the, uh, the theorem said, well I'll just write it. So the intersection of all KN, X is in that, right? Because X is in every one of the KNs, so it's in all of them, which is what the intersection is. Yeah? So we can't use like, the fact that compact sets are like, imply uh, the list of values and then to imply like, regular like, customer This is a good idea. 
although it's not necessarily um, these sets are closed and bounded but they're not closed intervals they could be Cantor sets or other kinds of weird things which are also closed and bounded yeah but this this is a good idea um, actually the nested interval property can be proved using this because every nested interval prop every nest every closed interval is compact and so automatically the nested interval property follows from the, the nested compact sets property all right uh, anyway can I just just to seal the deal here so X is in this in this intersection so the intersection is not empty that's what we wanted to show all right that's the end the nested compact sets. So the moral of the story, this, this fact about nested compact sets, I would say is not, it's not all that important. Like we're not gonna use it often the way that, I would say the nested interval property is kind of important. This is uh, more of a curiosity, but the, um, the moral of the story is a lot of the things that you think are true about closed intervals are actually true of any compact set. That's, the, that's what we're trying to get at here. All right. All right, we got 20 minutes left. Um, what I want to talk about, this is related to compactness, but it's not going to seem related at all. Maybe not, it's gonna come back eventually, but maybe not today. So this will seem like something completely different for a little bit, although it is very much related to compactness. It's a totally different way of looking at compactness, which um, is not about closed and bounded, but it's about, uh, well, the words that we're going to use is it's about open covers and sub covers. This will seem to have nothing to do with anything. It does very much have to do with compact sets, although I don't think it's going to come around today. Open covers and sub covers. Um, this is all about if you have a set, can you cover it up with a bunch of open intervals? That's called an open cover. And actually, it doesn't have to be open intervals. It could be any open set, but usually we use intervals. But anyway, that's, that's the definition of an open cover. So given a set, a subset of R, a subset of R, an open cover. Is a collection of open sets Usually, almost always, we're going to use intervals, but they could really be any open set. I would say typically intervals. Which cover A. And what I mean by cover is, i.e., A is a subset of the union of all of these open sets. I'll call them O. In our, this is the language that is used in our book, the notation, which looks a little, a little fancy. So here, each O lambda is an open set. And there are many of them. There could be infinitely many of them. So we have this big union, the union over all possible O lambdas. And this lambda is an element, that's a capital lambda. So this is, when you see this, you should, you should imagine that this is like, um, this you should imagine is like union of, you know, I equals one to infinity of O I or something like that. Although that, that one that I put inside the, inside the uh, cloud there, is um, that's a countable union. In fact, when you're talking about open covers, you, it can be any union at all. It doesn't have to be a countable uh, union of things. It could be a union overall, an uncountable set or something like that. Anyway, this is A is a subset. This is what it means for um, these sets, these are open sets which cover A. It means that A is a subset of the union of all of those open sets. You imagine, the picture you should have in mind is, um, oh, sorry, let me say one more bit of terminology. A uh, finite cover. So that's called an open cover when you have a bunch of open sets that cover your original set. A finite 
cup uh, open cover. is when um, just the number of open sets you use is finite. When A is covered by finitely many open sets, that's called a finite open cover. And one more simple terminology, a sub cover. is a choice of only some of the open sets. In a cover, in an open cover, I'll say. I can draw a bunch of pictures which will clarify all this terminology. A sub cover. Open cover means you have a set which is covered by a bunch of open sets. If it's finitely many open sets, that's called a finite open cover. And you can also talk about a sub cover, which means you only use some of those sets that were in the uh, original open cover. All right. For example, how about let's consider this to be my whole set, the interval from zero to infinity. So it's just. these numbers, right? Zero and everything greater than zero. Can you make an open cover? The answer is yes, you can always make an open cover of any set that you want, but uh, I can discuss um, a certain specific open cover. Uh, I'm gonna write O n equals the interval from n minus one to n plus one, where n can be any natural numbers. Sorry, actually, I, I need n to start at 0. So can I say n is in the set 0, 1, 2, etc. All right. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm beginning with the interval. So we have, you know, O0 is negative 1 to 1. And then O1 is 0 to 2. Every time I'm doing the open interval from n minus 1 to n plus 1. O2 is uh, 1 to 3, etc. Right? Uh, on the picture, they look like O0 is the open interval like that. This is O0. And then I have O1. Sorry, my. I'm going to make a little bit more room. This is O0. O1 goes here, right? This is O1. O2 goes here, O3 goes here, etc. Right? Up, up, up. And I hope you will agree, these open sets all together, they cover up the original set. That's called an open cover. It's just some specific way of uh, choosing a bunch of little patches. Typically we use open intervals because they're the easiest way to do it, but it could be any open sets. A bunch of little patches that cover up the whole set. That's called an open cover. Yeah. You could use big intervals if you want to. Yes. Then that's just one set that covers the whole thing. Yeah. You can do that. Yeah. So the question of, I give you a set, can you find an open cover? That's not an interesting question. Because you could always just use R as your whole open set. And that, that covers everything. Um, so this is an open cover. So um, these, uh, the O N make an open cover of A. All right. Is it A, is the question? Yeah, they, they are allowed to overlap. In fact, th these ones do overlap. I mean, I, I drew them kind of next to it, but like O0, O0 and O1 have a big overlap. Yeah, so they, they generally, in fact, yeah, since they're, since they're open sets, usually you have to overlap them or else they'll miss a point in the middle, right? Okay. Yeah, so they generally will overlap. 
Um, is that a finite cover? No, it's not. I said finite cover means the number of open sets is finite, which it's not in this case. In, in this case, in order to cover the whole thing, you actually need infinitely many of them. In fact, I think you need all of them, right? But you certainly cannot cover the whole thing using only finitely many of those. So this is not a finite cover, right? It has infinitely many things in it. Um, and what I just said about you actually need infinitely many of those, if these are the sets you're using, you need all of them in order to cover A. So I would say this is not a finite cover and actually there is no finite sub cover. That is to say, if you, um, if you only take finitely many of those sets, it's not gonna be a cover anymore, all right? So I will say, re just rephrasing, there is no finite sub cover. What, what I mean is um, taking only finitely many of these ones, it won't cover A. Right. There is no finite subcover. Actually, where compactness comes into this is all about finding a finite subcover of a cover that I that I gave you. All right, that has a lot to do with compactness. Okay, uh, let's look at another example. If there are no, that was a fairly simple example. Using that cover, it has no finite subcover. What about? How about this one? What about A equals the closed interval from 0 to 10? So this one just goes here to here. All right. And let's use the same open cover, right? That same description of those, those intervals. It also covers this one, right? So the same O n equals the interval n minus 1 to n plus 1. This also covers this set. I, get, I suppose I called them both A, but that also covers this A. Uh, I would ask you again, um, is, does this one have a finite sub cover? That is, can you still cover it if you only use finitely many? The answer is yes. You go down to you know, the 10th one and then those many will cover the whole thing. You don't actually need infinitely many of them. So this one, this has a finite sub cover, right? Here's a little spoiler for next time. What, what this all has to do with compactness is, it is a fact that in a compact set, every cover has a finite sub cover. That's, that's a property of compact sets, um, which is why this one, oops, this one does, but the previous one didn't. This one does because it's compact, it's closed and bounded. This one is closed, but it's not bounded. Right? So uh, finite subcovers are a big deal when it comes to compactness. But let's, uh, I'm, we don't, we're not gonna get into that. Um, oh, one, one thing that we can say is, um, I think it's true that this this set, the reason there was no finite subcover is because it was unbounded, right? And that actually will be true of any unbounded set. It's <coughs> not, not specific to this particular interval, but if there was any unbounded set and you used this open cover, it would have no finite subcover. So um, finite subcovers, well, let me just say, if A is unbounded, then some open covers will not have finite subcover, right? This is the beginning of connection between this and compactness because compact means closed and bounded. Boundedness comes into it here. If your set is unbounded and you use that same open cover that we just talked about, it automatically cannot have a finite subcover because of the unboundedness. All right. Um, if I were to write the contrapositive of that, 
it would say if all open covers have finite subcovers, then A is bounded. If all open covers have finite subcovers, then A is automatically bounded. I will mention this fact next time, and I will act like you all remember it by that time. I don't know if you will, but I will say, remember last time we said if all open covers have finite subcovers, then A will be bounded? You say, oh, yes, I absolutely remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah, sometimes I will leave out the word open. We, we only ever talk about coverings by open sets. Yeah. So when I say cover, I mean open cover. Thank, thank you for that. Um, all right, a, a couple more interesting examples. So this example, using those particular intervals, is um, these particular intervals are very easy to understand. But there can be weirder open covers. Here's another example. How about uh, I want to talk about some weirder examples? They're not super weird, but um, let's try a is the open interval 0 to 1, all right? And I would like to consider an open cover that looks similar to the one we talked about before, but this time I'll just write it. O sub Q is Q minus a half comma Q plus a half for every rational number, all right? So what we have is the whole set is the open interval from 0 to 1. And the open cover I'm using consists of intervals. I suppose these, these intervals, they all have width 1. And they're centered at Q for every rational number, Q, all right? So my open cover looks like a whole bunch of intervals. Actually, they're they're big, right? They're width one, which is what this, this entire picture is. Which are, that one is not centered correctly, sorry. That's worse. I'm trying to draw big intervals, like this one seems to be centered right there at some rational. And every rational number has its own interval around it. And that's where I get my open cover from, all right? Mm-hmm. This is somewhat weird. One, one thing that's weird about it is that this set, it's not like from n equals 1 to infinity or something like that. It's all sets centered around every rational number. But th that's the kind of thing that is necessary. That's why we have to use this somewhat weird notation here. It's a union not necessarily from i equals 1 to infinity, but it's a union just over any set that you want. Could be the q or could be all of r or something even weirder. All right, anyway, can we think about this one? Does it have a finite subcover? First of all, this does really cover the entire real interval, even though I'm only taking centered, these things centered at, irrash at rationals, it's still going to pick up all the irrationals also, because uh, these are big enough intervals. Um, does this have a finite subcover? I heard somebody say yes. If it does, you can can you tell me like specifically what like which of the sets when you say yes it means I only need to use finitely many of them. Like can you say like which ones do you need to use? Yeah, I think just O one half covers the whole set. Covers all of A. Yeah. The one right in the middle actually covers the whole thing. Yes? Did you also say something like it's like O cube but only two from zero to one or something? So it's multiple covers, but like. Yes? Okay. Sure, if you like. Like here I said, here, this is true for every Q in Q. Yeah, actually, I only drew some here, but this includes these intervals around every rational number everywhere. But if you only wanted them in around here, you could say just right here, I would write Q intersect. 0, 1, something like that. Yeah. 
you can say any any set you want right there. 